Hey y'all, thanks for watching. I just wanted to quickly inform you about my financial services agency, which operates in the life insurance space. So we help families with debt elimination plans and create tax favored retirement solutions. We support small businesses, nonprofits, worker owned co-ops, unions, and social enterprises with employee and member benefits. We offer white glove insura tech services to community banks, credit unions, financial co-ops, and CDFIs. And we provide enduring acceleration and downside capture strategies for all kinds of investors. Check out the link in the video description and enjoy the show. Welcome, Joe. Uh, Joe Manicozzi, really happy to have you here with us today as part of this special series that we're doing for Neighborhood Economics. Um, I, I'm especially looking forward to talking to you because we're both here in the Asheville, North Carolina area. And um, I have a personal uh, kind of story about the origins of Urban 3 uh, in a totally unrelated way, sort of. So I, I moved down here from Detroit area in 2014. And one of the first events I went to to try to get out and meet other people and meet other professionals was I went to a young professionals event at the Chamber of Commerce. And the speaker that day happened to be Pat Whalen. And Pat Whalen was one of the founders of Public Interest Projects. And he spoke about kind of just the really sort of the radical transformation that our town had gone through from the 1990s and over about the you know 15 20 years since public interest projects started investing in our local community and just the effects that that community had and it had such a big impact on me that I went up to Pat afterwards I asked to have a kind of a one-on-one -on -one talk with him and just kind of get the lay of the land here cuz I was interested in things like local investing and you know I was just starting my career in financial services um, but yeah, so I, uh, I, I don't want to keep talking here because I want to get have people hear from you. But Joe, could you just give people a little kind of background on yourself? And then I'd love to start maybe by digging in on the, the history of what Public Interest Projects does and then how that's evolved into Urban 3 and the new urbanists here. Sure, sure. Yeah, Pat's amazing. Um, I probably had a very similar uh, reaction to Pat, uh, but I was coming from... Uh, city design and uh, um, uh, land planning, uh, a lot of government work before I, and, and actually real estate finance before I came to Asheville. Um, I met Pat bef before I fully moved here. Um, and it was kind of interesting. I was, it was, you know, I was looking for a good real estate developer that's doing the right thing and public interest project was checking all of those boxes. Um, as a company, it's basically was created by Julian Price who put, um, Fifteen million dollars of his wealth into a basically a philanthropically minded for-profit real estate development company. So it had to act like a real developer and think of it as a revolving fund. The money just couldn't disappear. It had to revolve back into new things. Uh, uh, Dan Gilbert is doing this stuff up in Detroit right now mm -hmm. at a much larger scale. Um, but Pat was investing in businesses and getting things started up and doing all of the things the financial industry wouldn't, wouldn't do, wouldn't touch. Um, back then, um, when, when Pat was getting started in the nineties, banks wouldn't invest in downtown because no one was there. Mm -hmm. And so you, you get this like self-reinforcing, um, you know, if, if they don't put any money in, of course, you're not going to get any investment. No one's going to want to be there. And that's what was going on here. Um, yeah, but yeah I started working for Pat and, is it was pretty, uh, you know, bombed out almost like it was pretty burned oh, yeah. up and uh, which is what, what I was experiencing when I had left Detroit was there was this renaissance and revival. But, man, most of the place was still still pretty, pretty rough. And when I moved to Asheville, I was like, man, this place is popping tons of local stuff, tons of, you know, culture and like cool things happening. And then when I got there to learn, it was not like this no. even just, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, Asheville fell flat on its face. Um, in, in the early 20s, Asheville grew, uh, I think it was like 20% in population every single year of the decade, which is insane growth. And it had been experiencing that growth since the early 1900s. Um, and it was just, you know, phenomenal what was happening here before the, before the Depression. When the Depression hit and the city's books were audited, we thought we had, um, I, think what they, I think they thought they had... Uh, um, Seventeen million dollars in the bank is a is a is a reserve account. It, it turned out we had eighteen thousand dollars in the bank. Oh my! Um, 
the entire city council was indicted and the mayor committed suicide. That's how Asheville entered the Depression. Whoa. And it took until 1976. Uh, sorry, we thought we had $5 million in the bank, not 17. Um, it took until 1976 for Asheville to pay off its bonds. Asheville is one of the few cities in the entire country that said, you know, we took this money out, we're going to pay it off. Most cities renegotiated their debt. Um, and, you know, I don't know if it's just local politics. I don't know if it was the bondholders. I don't know if it's just stubborn Appalachian pride. Uh, who knows? But that was a choice we made. So Asheville couldn't do the things that a lot of other cities did. We couldn't do a lot of the highways, a lot of the, um, you know, the, the, the I-240 is, is a re very recent addition to Asheville um, within the span of my lifetime. So it's most cities were doing this stuff in the 50s and 60s. Asheville was 20 or 30 years behind. Um, but we also couldn't do things because they had a poor bond rating. So in 1976, when they paid off their last bond payment, was when you know, there was actually a plan to tear down most of downtown and build a downtown mall called the Wadley mm. Donovan Plan. Um, and that was probably the tipping point where people are just like, no, we're not going to do that. Um, and it was this interesting mix of recent transplants that had come here, um, you know, a lot of the new age kind of back to the land hippie movement and stubborn Appalachian, we don't like debt pride kind of got together in this confluence to vote down those, the bonds for that mall. And they did a different strategy. So the city and the county got together and did a downtown revitalization plan. Um, and everybody basically cooperated and moved forward. And on the private sector side, you get Roger McGuire, Julian Price, the Tessiers. There's a there's a handful of folks, actually probably more than a handful. It's probably about 20, 20 people um, that were mixing it up. And it wasn't just the investors and the real estate people. It was also the entrepreneurs, uh, people like Hector Diaz um, starting Salsas, you know, just bringing something different to Asheville. And that uh, um, uh, John Cram with the Fine Arts Theater and the um, the Blue Spiral Gallery. You know, there's lots of people that were doing interesting things and in making this work, and it takes a lot of people to do it. So it's not just public interest projects. Mm -hmm. But Pat tells shows that story of all of the people that had to come together to do this. Um, in Detroit's contrast, um, have you ever read Charlie LaDuff's book, Detroit? No, I, I need to. I'm going to write it down. Charlie LaDuff. Write that one down. Yeah, yeah Charlie LaDuff. He's, he's, a, he's a bit obnoxious. Um, but in the book, he says, go ahead and laugh at Detroit, make fun of Detroit, but realize we're an American city. We're the quintessential American city, and we just got there first. Mm -hmm. And he's right. Like the, the, the suicidal moves that Detroit did to itself, and also, was it Oakland County, the mm -hmm. next county over? Yep, just north. Just went, went, to, yeah, went to war with Detroit, basically, drained all of Detroit's population northward. And uh, the county manager there just had this attitude that, like, Detroit should die. And mm -hmm. it's just like, why would you do that when you're in this kind of cooperative economic system? But that's the attitude that you get where people that live outside the city don't see the value of the city. You know, it's, a, I think, in, I think it was 20, 2009, our state legislature called, one of our leg legislators called the city of Asheville a cesspool of sin. Do you remember those yeah. T-shirts? I, you know? I I've seen them. Yeah, so, so, something along those lines. Where hey, why not embrace it? If uh, yeah. <laughs> well, but it's like, why would you do that? Like we're all in this together. Could you imagine calling your cousin a cesspool? It's like, yeah, you're not going to really win some friends there. But, but the thing is, the city is this dynamic economic engine now, mm -hmm. that's floating the whole damn county. So, that's the reality of the situation. So rather than hate on us, how about sending us a thank you card for all the money that we're sending out to the county? The, the, the downtown um, has grown in a, by a factor of four in the last 10 years. The mm -hmm. county hasn't. Mm -hmm. you know, the county's worth $32 billion. This downtown's worth $2 billion, and it's only 100 acres. Show me yeah. another 100-acre parcel that's worth $2 billion. Yeah, so. no, that's that's a good point, and and I, I definitely saw the the revitalization parallels when I did move here from Detroit because I was a social worker and ran a food bank and was working in nonprofits up there. Um, but what I remember, and I had always kind of had this sort of 
kind of wall uh, separating these two worlds or sort of a two pocket sort of thinking where it was the idea that it's like, you know, obviously we had seen all the auto industry and the other businesses sort of bail on the city and bail on the workers in that area. And also I was on the nonprofit side. So I saw us trying to do a lot of repairing of the damages that had been done and the poverty that was just rampant throughout the county that I was in, which is right next to Wayne County, Washtenaw County. And the city I was in was like a little mini Detroit. It was like a smaller version with all the same problems. Um, but then on the other side, you know, what I saw happening in Detroit was one of the most rundown neighborhoods was one of the oldest neighborhoods, Corktown. And Corktown is where the big old train um, train station that used to run from the trains would head out of Detroit to Chicago. And it's this big, beautiful building built by the guy who, um, who built... Um, uh, Grand Central Station in New York. So beautiful architecture, but it was empty. It was boarded up. It was people would go in there and, you know, take photos and do graffiti, but like there was nothing happening there. But then this one business moved into downtown Corktown. And in the midst of the blight, they opened up a barbecue place. And it was a hit. And people started coming to Corktown all of a sudden. And everyone wanted to come to Slow's Barbecue. And then next door, a coffee shop opened up and then a little cocktail bar and then a real estate office. And now, 10 years later, 15 years later, that area, you can't find a place to rent in that neighborhood because it's so um, saturated with the market. And it's one of the most popular and the most revitalized places in the city. And I saw something sort of similar with when I came here to Asheville in what Pat and what Julian had done with public interest projects. But it seemed like from their perspective, it wasn't it wasn't even so much just natural development. Um, it seemed almost more of an intentional um, focused effort to actually not only to develop the real estate, but then to actually empower the businesses and the business owners who were their tenants and who were occupying the spaces there. Um, could you speak a little bit to their unique approach? Sure. Yeah. And you, 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 you nailed it. You know, it's, it's basically you take that wealth and invest it. The buildings, you've got to get them going so that people can be in them. Um, a lot of this is putting housing downtown, um, activating apartments, the ability to rent downtown. And, you know, again, the, the banks weren't doing it because the banks looked at the data and no one was living downtown unless they were on public assistance. And so their attitude was like, well, no one's there, so no one's going to be there. The market says that, there's no, that they haven't made that choice. It's like, well, if you've got no place to choose, you're not going to make that choice, right? So it's just getting upstream a little bit and to realize a lot of this is, you know, there, we've always had downtowns. There's always been some segment of the population that's been in downtowns. Just allow that to happen. And, and there were people living downtown, but it was all very ad hoc, sometimes illegal. But there were people that wanted it. You know, there were art studios and people just making the spaces happen. Roger was the first one that made um, condos downtown for sale as a product, improved that market, Roger McGuire. Julian and Pat came in after that. Now, Julian and Pat were actually thinking about starting a foundation or something like that. And they just realized Julian does, didn't have that wealth to really make a dif difference. So rather than do a foundation that was going to be doing revenue investments all around the, the county, let's bring it down to a point and let's have a really directed impact in downtown. But it was also doing it through catalytic projects. You don't do just one thing in one little area. You kind of like spread it around downtown and then people will fill in the gaps. And that's probably what happened. It, it's, it's, it's sort of a natural flow of economic um, capital when you're when you're when economic results when you're looking at downtown revitalization actually this goes back to jane jacobs uh death and life of the american city in 1963 where she was writing about it i don't know if you ever read uh jane jacobs books but she she talks about putting people downtown and things will change and getting out of the way so people can do things um, to the credit of the city and the county they were doing some of the bigger moves um I don't know if you know this, but you couldn't get liquor by the drink in downtown Asheville I had heard until that. the 90s. Which is crazy like, that now that's we're, such kind of a, insane. we're such a brewery town. Uh, we're such Beer a, City, know, USA. Yeah. And, and <laughs> just, just a little while ago, you, you, you had to go to a store <coughs> outside of the city and take it home. You couldn't even get a drink with your dinner. Yeah. or And this is also, I mean, let's come on, let's face it. This is also moonshine world up here. And it's just oh, like... Yeah. 
yep, yet it's illegal to drink in in a, in a restaurant. But uh, you know, th- that changed. Uh, I think that was in the '90s that happened. Um, Roger was active in the late late '80s, early '90s. Uh, the, the city did the downtown mass. The, one of the like I say, I think they called it the city center plan. After the the mall proposal died, um, they did some streetscape projects. Downtown parking, Wall Street. Wall Street was an alley. Um, mm. So so improving that physical public realm is also show, because as an entrepreneur, why would you go invest in a building if it's going to be just an alley, right? I mean, you might do it if it's cheap, but. Um, uh, you know, you're, you're just you want it's, the city putting their their investment in also uh, clears the decks a little bit. Changing the zoning, they removed parking requirements for businesses downtown. And think about how silly that is. That if you buy a building and start it up as a business, you have to buy the building next door and tear it down to make your parking work. Hmm. Like that was stupid. So the city, to their credit, was like, well, let's just not do that and get rid of the parking requirements, and we'll build parking structures so that we can have it centralized to handle many different buildings. So the, the Wall Street parking garage, the Rankin uh, parking deck, you know, th- there's a lot that was going on. Um, but public interest projects, um, 75% of the money, uh, what, what Pat was doing with as Julian's trustee is putting 75% of the money into the sticks and bricks, into the buildings, and 25% into the entrepreneurs. But what's, what I think is magic about public interest projects is you know, if, if we could look, scan around the room, one side of the room are, are all the creative types, and the other side of the room are all the organized people, accountants, CPAs. And it's this duality of you need to have both to do a successful business. And a lot of businesses can't afford a CPA. So what, what Pat was doing was if, if we invested in you to start a business for whatever, making coffee downtown, we would say, you know, Joel, you don't need to hire a bookkeeper. We'll take care of that, and we'll meet with you and share the numbers on a quarterly basis so you don't have to deal with that. So it's like having a, um, they call it a fractional CFO, having somebody that minds your financial system, and then meeting with you and helping you stay in business. Um, Pat has a saying that he's going to walk through a wall um, and, and beat his head through it, before letting letting a business fail, you know, it's just you have to do a lot of work. So the time was the direct opposite. We'd spend seventy five percent of our time with the businesses and twenty five percent with the buildings. Um, but you know, it's I, I tell people it's the BASF of downtown Asheville. Nobody knows who Public Interest Projects is, but they know the businesses. So they know Malaprops, uh, Laughing Seed, Orange, um, Peel. Orange Peel, Salsa, Zombros. Um, but a lot of the apartments downtown too. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the key thing, but that's, you know, this is for anybody that's ever read Jane Jacobs. This is, she's been talking about it since the sixties. Um, well, and you know, and even, even some of the newer businesses, I was very fortunate. A, a friend of mine was uh, starting up his own new barber shop and he wanted to open up downtown and I had done a brief amount of time in commercial real estate, so he asked me to come help him look at the space and you know, kind of ask the landlord certain questions. And when we got there, it was a public interest projects building. And as soon as I found that out, I said, man, you need to do this. So now he's had the local barber in Tap has been open down across from Zombra's there on Walnut Street for a good you know, eight years now. Um, and what I thought was really enlightening in this whole process is, because I think ultimately, what it always is going to come back to is property and ownership. You know, I, when I was doing commercial real estate, I was working in the Ann Arbor, Michigan market, which is where University of Michigan is. It's a very bustling, busy downtown. And um, when I was in high school, that downtown was filled with things like record stores and local u- used bookstores and local coffee shops. And, you know, everything was very local. Everything was very independently owned. But as I was there, once I got into commercial real estate, I could actually see what was happening was the rent prices for downtown were just going up and up and up and starting to skyrocket. And one after one, you would have the local places closing down and a chain would move in. So downtown became a place where all the new businesses down there were either a, you know, a Five Guys or a Walgreens or, a, you know, you could go down the list, but it was no longer this, um, this, this kind of you know, bastion of local 
creative businesses and it was instead becoming looking like just like every other place that had just the exact same businesses as across the way. And so I'm curious how that ownership or um, that the, the ownership and property piece, why does that play such a big role in the um, in keeping Asheville local? Well, um, you know, we have uh, Ben and Jerry's. We used to have where it's now um, Urban Outfitters used to be a CVS. Um, you know, there there is uh, there's um, God on Lexington. There's that I forget the name of it. Anthropology. It's a, a, anthropology. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. You know, independent businesses that dollar. Uh, I think it's. I think the number. I, I used to know this off the top of my head but i think it's like 80 percent of the dollar that you spend in an independent local local business 80 percent of that will stay in your economy if it goes if you shop at a chain or a national establishment it's the opposite now there's a reason why they're big businesses and they do well and i tell people i'm like don't hate the player hate the game but you better understand the game mm-hmm. and what they're good at is being efficient with their money and extracting that capital to their shareholders okay that's their game what can you learn from that what can we learn from wandering into anthropology and seeing how they do retail sales and how they do display and merchandise that's what a business owner can learn and this is one of the things that um, with Malaprops I mean Malaprops was a tiny uh, bookstore already already it was there were the entrepreneur was already there Emiko was already in downtown and Pat worked with her to move her a couple doors down into the spot that, that they're currently in. And in that was trying to get that business to realize you can learn from Barnes & Noble and just get stronger before they show up. So so it's not, you know, I, I don't think the the attitude isn't to be as draconian of, um, of black and white, good and bad, you can learn from both. Having a mix is, is good. You know, is downtown Asheville, are people coming here for anthropology? Probably. I haven't gone there. I haven't set foot in that building since, it's, since it, it, be, it became what it was. But I also didn't set, set foot in that building before it was anthropology. It was just a dead building. So, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, the wealth can be created and can be captured more with small independent businesses, the national chains. But I also think downtowns can benefit from having both. Here's the thing, though. We have a large downtown. Our downtown's 120 acres. So as long as we have that product, and here's what I would ask you as a, as a, as a resident of Asheville. Like, we know that it works in downtown. We know that it works in West Asheville. Why the hell don't we do more of it in North Asheville, in East Asheville, in South Asheville? Why the hell doesn't Enka Candler have a downtown out there? I mean, we, we all go to Black Mountain and and walk its four blocks oh, yeah. of downtown and it's cute as hell. Like, why is there not a Black Mountain to the west of Asheville? Mm-hmm. You have to go all the way out to Canton for that. So this is the thing is we can learn what for tens of thousands of years works for humans in the urban product and build more of it. But if you don't, and this is, the, this is, the, this is what happened in, um, in college towns, is that all of a sudden the, the financial industries realized Oh, there's a bunch of students with money in their pockets. We can take it from them. And five guys shows up. You know, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Um, so, again, don't hate the player, hate the game. It's The question is, why don't you have another Ann Arbor downtown in Ann Arbor or another place for that, that industry, those, those industries to go and cultivate both? It's, it's hard to just pass a law and say you can't be a national chain in, a, in, a, in our town. Cities try it doesn't work. It, it, it also it's not not constitutional. It usually doesn't last long. Right. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, and and it and it also I, I like what you're saying too because it sounds like it's, you know, ultimately it's more about laying the groundwork and what type of soil are you cultivating for what's going to grow there, you know. Like I I feel the same way. I I I'm a, you know I'm I'm almost I love I love the countryside out here in Leicester, um, but when you drive through downtown Leicester there's there's maybe one little strip mall right there's not really a walkable space for people to get out and be around each other and there's not really um you know what what I like about the downtowns that I've been in 
are there seems to be a shared shared spaces, whether it's parks, yeah. it's river walks, it's um, it's commerce streets. And when the more we get spread out and the more we kind of have to isolate ourselves in our little, uh, whether it's kind of suburban homes or kind of in these things, it's, it, it's almost like the less shared resources we have, the more you kind of have to buy. And so it, it almost makes sense from a, um, from a perspective of large institutional businesses and large institutional lenders and financial um, institutions that they would actually prefer us to be more isolated, that they would prefer us to be more spread out and have to, you know, ins- like there's a tool library um, in, uh, in Kenilworth, right? Um, but yeah. if that didn't exist, everyone would have to buy their own tools. They couldn't share them. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not sure if, if I have a question in there, but I, uh, I'm curious if, if that's given you any kind of thoughts that are coming up as I'm talking about that. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if you're picking up Pat in the background. He just showed up. Um, <laughs> so, that's okay. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the, this, this book right here, let's see, boom, Strong Towns. Do you know that book? I don't know. You're giving me a lot. So, yeah, Chuck is going to be a speaker at the conference this year. And um, I'd recommend his book. Um, I'm building a small, a strong town. Um, you know, I don't think I don't think anybody. I don't think there's a want to it. I think I think we fall prey to marketing. Um, you know, it's like just watch a sports game and like a, a basketball game or a football game. You're going to see a truck commercial every single commercial break. You know, um, how many people i mean maybe out in leicester people are taking those trucks on dirt roads but most of these trucks don't go there um the same is true of a lifestyle we've been marketed a certain lifestyle of separation and it's nice to not have a neighbor to not have dogs barking you know i've got i, I live on a and it's less than a tenth of an acre my neighbor's got this ridiculously large dog that's dumb as a box of rocks and likes to bark a lot you know and i and she, they feel bad. They they just don't know how to train the dog, and so I'll go over and try to help them. But how many people want to do that? You know, it's mu- it's much nicer to have seven acres around you, and you don't hear that dog, or you might hear it howl or something like that. Um, but it's not going to interfere with your day. So, so the promise of suburbia is an incredible promise. Um, you know, I could I could criticize you and say like, you know, what are you, what are you doing living way the hell out there? Yeah. Um, all of your goods and services I, are right I've, here. And I've got one so, of those trucks that doesn't go on dirt roads very often, to be honest. So I'm yeah. not above that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I go mountain biking. So as, as people tell me, like, you know, I've got friends that live out in the, in the, in the forest. And, like, we go mountain biking. I'm like, well, I'll go out and visit the mountains. I don't want to destroy the mountains. And so the more of us that make those choices, the more of us will invade the landscape. But hang on, let me show you something. This is a book from 1973 that the Nixon administration put out. The Costs of Sprawl. Um, so the Nixon administration in 1970, like, I mean, I don't know how old you are. I'm 50, 54. I remember the, the, the gas crisis of the early 70s where you used to have to queue up in line to get gas, and only certain license plate numbers were allowed per day to go through. And the, so the federal government stepped in and goes, this is not sustainable. This pattern is not sustainable. There were people in the 50s that knew that it wasn't sustainable. Mm-hmm. Yet we built it. So did you grow up in a single-family detached house? Yeah. Farm, yeah. Old, old farmhouse so, in western New York outside of Buffalo. Yeah. Okay. I grew up in, I grew up in Rome, New York, oh, up yeah. near Utica. Yeah, yeah. So those patterns are not sustainable yet we were induced into them by highway building and all sorts of other things um redlining uh mm-hmm. the the H- homo holc maps from 1934 the federal government shifted mortgages from seven-year mortgages to 30-year mortgages when i talk to people i'm like you realize there was a day that we didn't have 30-year mortgages and everybody's like what are you crazy like no, Moses didn't hand us thirty-year mortgages. Like these weren't didn't just come with us from the the great ooze. Mm-hmm. These are things that are policies. So all those policies induced a certain pattern of development, and then you fund it with highway conduits of billions and billions of dollars. Just I twenty-six that's coming through Asheville is going to completely destroy 
Mills River the way that we know it because it's going to open up and induce more people to move out there because we're facilitating that traffic flow. That's a cost put into the ground for somebody to have a cheaper house out in Mills River. Here's the question. Did we ever decide to spend a billion dollars on affordable housing in Asheville? Like what would Asheville look like if we could change Patton Avenue and not have the Kmart and have some a, a village there, mm-hmm. you know? These are choices that we're not getting allowed to make because the system, the financial industries have set up a certain capital flow. Um, and, and the thing is, just let's just be conscious of it and realize these, these, this is how these patterns happen. But Chuck, Chuck will get into that at the conference with the, with the, the cost of streets. I mean, Leicester Highway, they just widened that thing to high heaven. Yeah, they did put in a sidewalk along it, which is nice because for, I mean, I don't, I, I actually, there's, there's a guy who I've stopped twice to pick him up and give him a ride because he'll, he'll be carrying either cans or a giant metal barrel that he picked up somewhere and he's walking along this crazy dangerous road and like, and it's, it's just so um, unsafe there. But I, I, I also wanted to, but they, to they, ask they, you, they oh, just, okay. they just built a sidewalk. I mean, let yeah. that wash over. You said it. Right, so we have a Department of Transportation. Is that not a transportation corridor? Why is a sidewalk not transportation? Mm-hmm. So that that modality that we're all born with isn't invested in, right? We all, well, we we all, we all, most of us, ninety nine point nine percent of us could walk, right, or or bicycle or wheelchair down a sidewalk. Why does all the money go to the one modality of cars? with the Department of Transportation is that in this our public dollars they're using to do that. Right. So they're, they're making choices to facilitate and grease the skids for a certain type of development pattern. So that, that could all be different, you know, and when I moved here in 2003, the folks in Leicester didn't even want to have zoning. So they didn't want any land use controls and their, their whole attitude was like property rights. It's like, okay, that's great. You know, it's like, but, if you don't plan or put any rules in place, you're going to end up with the garbage that's delivered to you. Mm-hmm. And because it's impossible to build housing in Asheville because everybody here fights everything that gets proposed, it's not like pe- you can shut the door and people won't move here. So they're going to places that are the path of least resistance. So it turns into drive until you qualify, that people that are low wealth move further out, which is actually more expensive for them right. when you add in the cost of transportation. Right. So it's just it's simple economics that we just we let our emotions get in the way. What um because I know that with the um, urban three, um, you guys have kind of this is a, a newer development that's come out of public interest projects where you've taken some of those lessons that you've learned and then help other cities develop and um, kind of create more equitable. Um, you know, I know you guys focus on things like visualizing revenue, cost of service, um, redlining, re, you know, kind of fair taxation. Um, I guess give us a little overview on, on what you guys, how you guys have taken those lessons and, and implemented them in other places. Yeah, well, it just goes back to Pat. One of the things I was learning from Pat, I mean, you saw his presentation. And when I used to sit there and listen to his presentation, I'm like, dude, that's way too much information. Um, but, but he's going to make the argument and his, the PowerPoint that he had was called the, the economic and environmental case for urbanism. Hmm. So you live here, you actually live where it's a little bit more mixed than Asheville. Asheville's become this monolithically, um, uh, liberal cabal. I mean, it's just, I don't recognize Asheville from when I moved here. Mm -hmm. The strain was here, but it wasn't, it wasn't just so intense. But when public interest projects had to make its case, here you have a downtown real estate developer. I, I remember being at, at, at parties with friends, and they were, you know, m- making some comments about the orange peel. And I'm like, do you understand how much the insurance costs just to run that orange peel per year? And and they're like, no. And I was like, it's it's six figures. And they're just like, what? I'm like, yeah, it's called business. You know, it's just these, you have to, you can't just open the doors and let people just freely walk in and just drink and not have consequences. So you have to have insurance. It's just explaining that to people. So on on the left, all developers are evil. And on the right, 
if you're doing stuff downtown, you're somehow subsidized and you're taking the public's wealth. And, and the free market is suburbia and boxes and strip malls. And the reality is this direct opposite. So Pat was just basically trying to explain that in the PowerPoint shows that you don't build wealth with a Walmart. You know, you don't build wealth with boxes. You build it with the fine grain, small businesses. And it's also better for you if you start stacking people. If you don't, sorry, if you don't have a yard, it's actually better for the planet. Um, and that's the, 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 we just have been brainwashed into trees are awesome. It's like, yeah, trees are awesome if you stay out of them. You know, stay out of their ecosystem. Don't damage their water flow. Don't just just stay out. If you want to keep farmland, don't build anything on it because that soil content and the richness of that soil. Once you put asphalt on it, it's gone. And it's just getting people to understand that. And so, I don't know. I, I consider myself more of an idiot. I, I just I have to see pictures because I'm trained as an architect. I'm a visual guy. Mm-hmm. And so I started taking some of Pat's shows and reworking them and just condensing them down. And the thing that really kind of drove the point home to me was the value per acre analysis. And when you do that, Malaprops, the building, not not the building, the building that Mobilia is in right across the street from Malaprops, that building's a a hundred times more tax potent than a Walmart. Wow. The problem is whenever we talk about a Walmart, we always talk about it in, in, in total productivity. So it's like, Okay, so this Walmart that's 34 acres is producing X million dollars of, of taxes. It's like, well, that's tr- true, but it took 34 acres of a farm of a called Asheville. Yeah. Yeah. I remember yeah. when I first, what, I, I, um, I, I was able to do a Peace Corps over in Eastern Europe. And just the, the, just the, cond- the, how much more things were condensed, I remember being one of the biggest culture shocks I faced when I came back to the States. I remember walking into yeah. a, it was a it was a it was a big box store like a Walmart or a Target, and I remember looking around and being like, "Holy cow!" The whole the village I was living in could fit in this store, yeah. and just or the size of a parking lot. When you when you're used to it, it doesn't you don't think twice about it. But the moment that you move away and then you come back, it's it was it was it was a little it was shocking, honestly. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, he exposed all of that to me, and I was doing the same. I was I would take his show. And one of the things that's awesome about public interest projects is we were all engaged in community activity as well. We were in different nonprofits, and so I was doing the show as well, but just my version of it. And I went and did a presentation at Smart Growth America in 2009, and uh, uh, the uh, it was on it was on taxation. And, and I had a quote from Mark Twain that said, a person who won't read has no advantage over one who can't read, right? So I have a bunch of books behind me. If I choose to not read them, I'm still illiterate, you know? It's like, I don't, I don't know what's in those books. But if I read them, I might get some stuff shoved in my brain. And so I had my hand in the air. And these are all like people that want to do smart growth and community economic development, affordable housing. And I said, so, you know, who's read your local tax policy? I was expecting a couple nerds to raise their hand, but not a single person raised their hand. And I was like, what the hell? Like, do you even understand? If you don't understand, that's how we pay for government, right? You don't even, and you work in government, and you don't even, you're not even curious. <laughs> so I was, I was blown away. And some people asked me, like, could you do this for us? And that's how Urban 3 got started. Hmm. So I was just doing it on the side uh, till about 2012, and that's when we started Urban Three full time as a consulting company. Um, but that's all public interest projects, ethos, down to one little silo basically of it. Is let's just show the financial models. And what we do is, what you'll see in our work is it's very visual. We're doing a three dimensional model. Of, yeah, I of noticed the city. that. I was impressed with those um, those three D models. Were really cool. What do what do cities use that for? Like, how are they how are they taking that information, and what are they doing with it? Well, the the first the first part of it is is a bit of a wake up. So, if I can show you your brain with your creative thought process in green and your brainstem activity in blue right here, you know, I can show you what's going on in your brain. Why not show you what's going on in a place, right? So this is this is Buncombe County. You live here. I live here. Gray is non-taxable, so here's Mount Mitchell, mm-hmm. and here's Pisgah. The national forest. Yeah, low value. Yeah. yeah, they're non-taxable. So just to be crude about it, they don't pay me taxes. I don't care, right? Okay, fine. 
green is low value, so here's um, Big Ivy up here, and then here's the Biltmore Estate, which is Biltmore Estate. What the house is on, the one the parcel that the house is on, is worth one hundred million dollars. So it's it's very valuable, right? Yeah. But how many how many one hundred and eighty thousand square foot houses are there in the county? One. <laughs> or in the right in the country. In, in the, on, <laughs> yeah, there's in one. The country, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's on eight thousand acres of land. So it's like saying miles per tank. But this is how people talk about economics, and it's like this is stupid. This isn't t- like we don't say miles per tank when we talk about cars. So rather than total value, this is value per acre. The model just shifted, mm. and you know this is where a lot of people stop. And I'm like, no, like, communicate it. So this is what it looks like in three D. So if I if I just kept it here. You know, a lot of people are just like, there's some nerds that'll know, like, oh, 20 million is way more than 6 million, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at the histogram. But this shows you the scale difference. And you can see West Asheville right here. You can see downtown. You can also see downtown Black Mountain. Yeah. You know, and then you can see the sprawl on the south side. You can see what goes out to Leicester, which is, Mm -hmm. here's Leicester Highway right there. That doesn't look all that great. You know, it's a bunch of garbage. Um, but the thing is, like, why not have a Black Mountain on the west side over here in Enka Candler? Like, why didn't that happen? Um, why didn't it have? You get something good with Biltmore Park, but not a whole lot compared to all of the trash around it. Um, the other thing is, you can see a scale of wealth. Look at over here by Chun's Cove mm-hmm. on the on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Notice how that is less productive. Also, Biltmore Forest right here is less productive than West Asheville. Would you have known? that Biltmore Forest or Chun's Cove is less productive than West Asheville? No. So no. show it to people. So this is this is our old thesis. Just show you the information and not just talk about it. Yeah. How, um, I'm curious what your take on, obviously you're going to be at the, the conference coming up here at Neighborhood Economics, but from your background in developing communities, developing downtowns, urban planning. I know you went to Harvard um, to, to learn about this stuff. What is it about neighborhood economics that you feel like is either unique or that is exciting to you? Well, it's kind of funny you mentioned those things. Let me, let me give you another, another story. I grew up in the Rust Belt, um, Italian family. Um, a town is called Rome, New York. Lots of Italians there. Um, my my uncle Frank had an Italian restaurant. Get a good carbonara really downtown, had, hopefully. <laughs> uh, no, you you get it at home. You don't go yeah, to yeah. restaurants for Italian food, <laughs> you know. And it's like my my uncle my uncle uh, Louis had a Sicilian bakery. My uncle Joe had an Italian pastry shop. He paid my mom three hundred dollars to name me Joe. Yeah, Louis Joe. Up, yeah, yeah. This is <laughs> yeah. I grew I grew up. I grew up in small businesses, in family businesses, Mm -hmm. in that economic system. My Uncle Joe's pastry shop was taken in imminent domain, and he lost a ton of money Mm -hmm. and his building, his investment. This is an Italian immigrant son who creates a business, buys a building. He had renters upstairs, and the building was taken. I didn't realize, like, you know, it was my Uncle Joe. He's kind of, he's an interesting dude. Um, But we'd hear these stories of what he went through fast forward i go to planning school and we talk about all of this stuff in books back here of oh this happened called urban renewal it's like well it happened to my family and knowing that they knew it was the wrong thing to do when you read documents of what was going on there were business owners that were like this doesn't seem right you know but they didn't have the political clout now on the flip side you have politicians and i'm not going to debase them by saying this but the truth is they win a popularity contest Mm -hmm. and the next thing you know they have to manage really sophisticated decisions they're not they don't go to grad school to learn this stuff so it's not fair to them to put them in this position so what i find is that oftentimes the people that are in the middle the bureaucrats all speak their own language and they're only trained in their own little silos they don't see how it's connected because that's not their job so there's, a, there's this tragedy of decision-making because no one's on the same page. So the whole thing that we try to do is just give you a visual so everybody can see what's going on, and then just be curious. You know, just start asking questions. Let's get past, like, these are the way things have always been done. Let's, that's not, that's not going to solve things. Right. And what I enjoy about this conference is that it's all the folks that know that things need to change in the system. 
and it's becoming aware of it and, and facile with how to navigate through that system and how to tell their own stories and build their local wealth. That these are folks that are trying from the grassroots level to grow their economic system of the whole community. And that takes leadership. It takes, it takes a certain amount of person that's going to run through that wall, you know? Um, and that's what I enjoy about that conference is it's a whole conference full of folks like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I find it to be a really unique and um, really inspiring um, collaboration, too, at the same time of people that where, you know, Kevin has really hit home to me that there's no litmus test here. We're all just about improving our communities, improving the lives of the communities, especially that have been divested from, um, let alone not invested in. Um, and then, you know, Getting out of this two-pocket thinking where we feel like business is only to um, maximize and extract profit and that, you know, churches and nonprofits um, are the only thing that can do good and that there's no partnerships to be had there. Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm really excited for it. I'm excited to get to, um, to spend some time with you down there in San Antonio. I'm excited for um, just a lot of things that are going to be coming out of there that I think are really exciting based on what I've heard about what happened with Jackson, Mississippi last year, what's happening in San Antonio this year. Um, what I love about the work that you're doing is about kind of, you know, in my own personal growth journey, one of the values that I've come across is trying to like let go of illusions, you know, through things like meditation and things like mindfulness in my own life and get past the conditioned thinking that we all have because every every single one of us was conditioned to think a certain way and to actually see reality as it actually is and um that's something that i'm just like really really picking up on what you're doing is it's like okay let's let's drop the uh, assumptions let's question the assumptions at least yeah. and see if they hold up to that questioning um, because I think a lot of times we get taught, as you said, we either get taught about our silo or we get taught about our certain per, uh, particular skill set or a certain thing that we need to do. But a lot of times we aren't taught to actually think for ourselves. And what I say on our show is one of the things that we do is we bring on the people who are questioning the assumptions that there's just one bottom line. And yeah, Joe, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that we got to have you on here today. Thank you all for listening here. Um, and until next time, remember, we are each other.